So to paraphrase, your way is instead of determining your body weight with calories, and that you're if you're losing weight, you're gaining weight, your weight stable, it's fat. You're losing fat because you're in a calorie deficit. You're gaining fat because you're in a calorie surplus, or you're maintaining fat because you're in a calorie maintenance. Warning. You're watching Dr. Todd Lee TV, where theoretically you could learn a bunch of cool shit. Back by popular demand, a scientific snitch. We have some graphs that she put up on Instagram the other day with a revolutionary new way of approaching maintenance calories, which actually makes much more sense. So without wasting time on asking questions, I'm just going to cut right up into these graphs. All right. So I'm going to explain this in a similar way that I explained in my YouTube video, but with a little more depth and a little more detail. So <clears throat> starting off, we know that when you are eating maintenance or actually when you gain weight and that weight is going to be predominantly fat, that is, um, what your body does is it's called lipogenesis and adipogenesis, which basically means adding fat and adding fat cells. Specifically, adipogenesis is the predominant thing that occurs when you overeat. Now, I think we can all agree that when you lose body fat, you are basically stimulating something called lipolysis, which would be burning body fat. We can use those two physiological um, processes to define what a caloric surplus and deficit is, because physiologically, there's no real such thing as a, a true maintenance, a true surplus, a true deficit, because your body weight is changing all the time. You wouldn't call somebody who's dehydrated in a calorie deficit because they lost body weight, even though traditionally the, um, the concept of being a deficit in a deficit is defined by losing body weight. Um, but with that being said, like, as I said before, like you wouldn't define somebody who's having a lot of salt and increasing their body weight as no longer at maintenance calories because their body weight increased. It's just because they had too much salt. So there's a bunch of like exceptions that can kind of be mitigated by this model of lipogenesis and adding fat or dipogenesis and adding fat and then lipolysis as burning fat, because it's just you're keeping it to one physiological mechanism, one tissue, and you're not really worrying about throwing in a bunch of confounding factors. Make sense? So to yeah. So to paraphrase, your way is instead of determining your body weight with calories, and that you're if you're losing weight, you're gaining weight, your weight stable, it's fat. You're losing fat because you're in a calorie deficit. You're gaining fat because you're in a calorie surplus or you're maintaining fat because you're in a calorie maintenance. Yes, pretty much. And the reason why I don't go by body weight, as I said before, is because there's so many confounding factors. You can build muscle right. in a slight deficit and you can build muscle in a slight surplus. You can build muscle at maintenance. So it doesn't really make sense to define the surplus or a bulk. It doesn't make sense to define a cut or a deficit. And it does not make sense to define maintenance as just by body weight it just doesn't make any sense because your body weight is not just one thing if right. I, I hope so, that makes sense yes it makes total sense to me we just had to lay the groundwork with this graph first yeah just to mention about this graph the reason why your body stores extra body fat is because mm -hmm. you're literally consuming too many calories so when you are consuming enough calories to maintain your body you don't need to dip into body fat storage and you don't need to store extra body fat. Well, you're, you're, you're getting ahead of, you're getting ahead. Let's just pull up that graph, right? Cause oh, I was yeah, just yeah. like, we are adding in another variable, which is one of these two graphs. Which one did you want to add in first? Uh, this is what your bulk would look like if you hypothetically kept your caloric intake exactly the same, pretty much. Um, right, so this red line is caloric intake. Yes. That is how much you are eating. And this is the start. And I know that I know you know I know this, but there's people who don't know how to read a graph. So that's why I'm explaining this to them. 
Yes. So no. the y-axis is calories, i.e. arbitrary units. So arbitrary units just refers to like your body weight in pounds, your body fat in percentage. Um, basically, whatever the arrows are indicating, that's what the y-axis is. And then the x-axis would be the time. The dotted lines are the minimum amount of protein needed for muscle growth, the minimum amount of energy needed for muscle growth, and then the minimum amount of, uh, eh, the minimum amount of energy to maintain muscle growth. And those dotted lines will come into play when we start discussing the cutting part of this equation. But currently, mm -hmm. we're just talking about bulking. So it doesn't really matter because you're in a caloric surplus. Now, when you bulk, your body fat will rapidly increase. I'm pretty sure we are all familiar with that because your body well, is eating more than what it needs. So you're going I, to store the extra energy. So rather than confusing them with extra details, let's just explain this graph. So the calorie intake is a straight line here. So yes. one would assume that's a maintenance. Yet I notice you've got maintenance calories starts here and goes up. Yes. So what so it looks like is as you eating a fixed amount, the body fat starts climbing and that's yeah. driving up body weight when you cross this point and that's driving up your maintenance. Yeah. That, so um, if you don't mind, uh, just to quickly explain what what it what the maintenance calories is. So mm -hmm. to be in a caloric surplus, you have to have a maintenance calories that you are going off of. Because you can't eat in a surplus if you don't have a maintenance to begin with. So, like, for example, if you're eating 200 calories above maintenance, and let's say the space between the red line and the mm. maintenance calories line in the very beginning of the graph is your, yes. Let's say that's your 200 calorie surplus. Okay, you're in 200 you, calorie surplus. Got yes. It. As you gain weight, that maintenance amount is going to slowly climb because your body weight and your maintenance calories are directly correlated because how much weight you carry will directly mm. correlate with how much energy you spend. So it's parallel lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And then as this goes up, your weight goes up and that the way you're gaining the weight is body fat. It looks, it looks like it's more body fat than anything else because the slope of the body fat line is higher than the slope of the body weight line. So the body fat percentage line is just indicating what body fat percent you're at. And because mm -hmm. you're eating more than what your body needs to maintain its tissues, mm -hmm. then you're going to store a lot of that energy as body fat. Some of the extra protein will go towards your hair and nails, yada, yada, yada. It's just the extra energy is being stored. It is not being used because it's extra. You can't right. force extra energy to go towards something when it's extra because you're in a surplus. Um, now, as your maintenance calories climbs with your body weight, you eventually will hit the, um, your maintenance calories will eventually hit the amount of calories that you are eating at that time to maintain a growth right. surplus. When you hit so that- Now, this is no longer a surplus. Now this is maintenance. Exactly. So, all right. So maintenance, and because this is maintenance and you're not in a surplus, you're not gaining body fat, so thus you're not gaining body weight. Yep. But is this line supposed to be muscle? Yep, that is just muscle. Okay. So, so it means muscle. that even the difference between eating at maintenance and eating in a surplus is that at a surplus you gain fat, whereas maintenance you gain just pure muscle. That's pretty much it. And the reason for that is because when you think about muscle tissue, it's stimulated to grow via mechanical tension. You're not like the, with a given amount of muscle tissue on your frame, you mm -hmm. can't just force energy into that muscle tissue to grow. That's what training is for. And it's the reason why people who are like in a coma, you could pump mm -hmm. all the energy you wanted into somebody who's in a coma, but they won't gain any muscle. They'll just gain fat. And that's the concept.
Greetings, Earthlings! Like, subscribe, and share this video. Share with a friend. Share with enemies. Share with people who think they know everything. I am a medical doctor, and I could be your doctor. Click the link in the description box. I can order you blood work. I can read the blood work. I can treat any illnesses. I basically, it's like an HRT clinic that's a one-man army. Also, I do coaching. Dr. Karina Dotson and I have a coaching business called Apex Coaching. So if you sign up with me, you get coaching, which is nutrition, programming, competition prep, or lifestyle coaching, as well as all the medical stuff. So you have two doctors in one business. It's going to be contest prep, the nutritionist, the programming person, and the doctor all in one. You can't beat it. It's integrated. It works the best that way. You'll love it. Make sure to do it. Click the link in the description box. All right. I love how you chose the star. It's like what you give a kid for doing a good job in like kindergarten or something. I just like I chose a random thing on bio render because I was just so frustrated trying to make this graph. Uh, <laughs> but um, now the dotted lines are going to come into play. So this is what happens during a quote unquote cut. As your body weight decreases and your body weight, once again, is directly correlated with your maintenance calories. Um, as your body weight decreases, so does your maintenance calories or how much calories you maintain on. So you'll notice when you hit the star, your body weight maintains itself because at that time you hit your maintenance calories. Right, can we back that up a little bit? All right. Sure, so we've got the pink line is body fat percentage. The black mm -hmm. line is strength. The and muscle blue mass. line is maintenance. Oh, okay. The red is caloric intake. So it looks like you're starting where you're eating the same calories as your maintenance. So thus your body fat stays the same. Then you drop your calories below your maintenance, you start losing body fat. And mm -hmm. that slows the rate of muscle growth. Yes, it slows the rate of muscle growth. And then in addition, that dotted green line is your body weight, just to clarify. Okay. So as your body weight slowly decreases and as your maintenance slowly decreases, your body fat is also slowly decreasing because you're in a calorie deficit. So as you eat in that calorie deficit, you're going to eventually hit your maintenance calories. And that's what we call a weight loss plateau. So where's the weight loss plateau? Line three? Star. Each of the stars. Oh, okay. Duh. All right. Each so time. Say one more time. So basically, we know that body. Uh, each so time the blue line hits the red line, we have to reduce the calories to keep the weight loss going down. Exactly. Right? Yep. Okay. So you could think of this as like months at a time, like you're hitting a plateau like every couple months or so because you lost like five, six pounds and now you're mm -hmm. you have a new maintenance. It's mm -hmm. the same idea as bulking, except now you're doing the exact opposite. However, now you have the dotted lines to worry about, which is the minimum amount of protein needed for muscle growth, the minimum amount of energy needed to grow muscle and the minimum amount of energy to maintain muscle. And as you slowly lower and lower the body fat percentage and lower the body weight, the less sustainable that muscle growth will be because you're just right. not giving yourself the energy. So some of these lines don't look like they coincide exactly where they're supposed to be. It looks like at this point you stop losing muscle. So this dotted line here should probably be here, right? Well, it's not a steep cutoff. So people have been found to and this is the reason why I made the graph like this oh, okay. um, in bariatric patients who are eating 600 to 800 calories with the entire portion of their digestive tract that processes protein being bypassed, they were able to gain muscle with just training, which goes to demonstrate that even though protein is needed, you can still maintain a certain level of muscle mass. That's weird. All right. So, all right. So here, this is the line in which you, you're you're below the muscle threshold. And, and so we're start, starting to yeah. attenuating great gains. And now you start losing strength and muscle. Mm -hmm. And then here is the amount of calories you need to maintain muscle. And here is the amount of calories or protein you need in order to stop from losing. And so this core doesn't really correspond with these three points, but it's the general theme of this whole category, category three. Is that yeah. once you hit below the th the minimums, not only can you stop gaining, you can start losing muscle and strength. 
Yeah, and that all depends directly on how hard you're training and all that other stuff. But once you get below a certain point, like if you're eating like 200 calories, there's pretty much no way you're not going to lose muscle. So it's like a, it's a very, there's a very low amount of energy that is required to gain and maintain muscle. So for those who are like, oh yeah, you can't build muscle in a deficit. We know that's not true. Okay. So uh, the ipso facto, if there is a fourth category over here called mm -hmm. rebound, where someone says, okay, start eating your maintenance again, and they think their maintenance is over here, and they start eating up here, then their fat's going to just skyrocket in that rebound phase. Yeah. So the point would be is as soon as you like increase calories, your fat is going to increase to the extent that you were there before. So it's the same amount of like, it's the calorie ratio. It's just, it's going to increase a little bit faster. So you might end up with less muscle and a little bit more body fat, but it's mm -hmm. not going to be drastically different from your starting point to the point where you're going to be like obese versus extremely lean and on mm -hmm. a show. So like, for example, uh, just to provide a real life example, even for a lot of bodybuilders who've done like binge rebrounds that I've noticed, at least online from what I've seen, um, they don't go from being stage lean to morbid obesity. They go from right. stage lean to fluffy. So it's that sort of idea. Well, so I guess where I'm going with this is the idea would be post show, you want to get up to this point as fast as you can, maybe within a couple of days. But then you slowly, you don't want to raise your calories up from there. You want to keep your calories stable and the muscle will just keep growing and growing and growing. And your body fat will eventually catch up to this point and it'll stay there like it did in um, this graph. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I would say, though, like if you can slow, like slowly increase those calories that would be a little bit more beneficial just because when you drastically increase calories after that sort of deficit if you notice your muscle mass slowly starts going down so if you drastically increase at that point you're kind of starting in a place where you have a little less muscle mass than before so when you right. drastically increase you're not really increasing it to your maintenance from before you're increasing it to a surplus from before and then you're going to end right. up eating a lot more body fat than what you originally planned for. Which is what I was trying to say, but I didn't say correctly. So I guess my point is these minimums sound like you never want to get below this anyway. And that if you have to get below this minimum, you should not go below that minimum. You should instead do a diet break and stay at a maintenance. And is that, but how, how does this model account for um, diet breaks or... Well, the entire idea of diet breaks would be just adding in calories. So you would just be adding that to the actual. So I, I don't, here's the thing. I don't count calories day by day. I count calories by week. So like I'll take the average amount of calories per week. So if you were to just throw in that refeed day into like the average mm -hmm. calories per week, you could still mm -hmm. account for this model because remember our bodies aren't tied up in a box. So when we eat a certain amount of calories, if we have on average a certain amount of calories, that's what would be the daily amount. Like we'll have fluctuations on a daily basis. So honestly, like counting calories day by day doesn't really make sense. And the whole entire idea of refeeds is to give yourself a mental and physical break where you're improving your when you're where you're increasing glycogen stores, um, probably going to improve your performance over the next two days. Um but all in all, that's the idea, at least from what I've, what people have reported back to me, at least. So these graphs look awesome. I feel like this might even work for natural bodybuilders. How, but I feel like it doesn't account for a lot of stuff like the actual way that people cut for a show. And what they do is they have periods of time where they come out of a deficit to a certain amount, not all the way back up to the original maintenance, but they come out of a certain amount and they don't seem to put fat back on in that week or two weeks. It seems like they refill their glycogen supplies and whatnot. So 
like you, I guess that's what you just said. I'm just saying in a different way that I'm being too specific to the minute or the hour. Like we're taught, if you miss one meal, that's a missed opportunity to grow muscle. That uh, every single four hours you must have protein to spike mTOR. It has to be three grams of leucine every four hours. Otherwise, you're leaving gains on the table. The funniest and, part is that leucine is not even the only amino acid that stimulates mTOR. But um, in addition to that, uh, I guess you could just extend the graph a little bit. So like post or like being on stage would probably be below those minimum amounts. So you wouldn't be growing all that much when you are stepping no. on stage. So what the main goal would be, would be to like slowly increase your calories back up to a point. And that's what a lot of bodybuilders have done, at least from what I've seen online. I, I'm, I'm not a bodybuilder yet. I do want to get into it, but um that's like the idea is to when you diet down to that low body fat percentage, you're mm -hmm. not going to see bodybuilders trying to build from that low body fat percentage to like, like. Uh, That's what I was saying. That's what I was saying was increase your calories up so that they're at least above the minimum cutoff point. And exactly. then rather than ramping it up, which is what other people do and do a rebound, just keep them there and let this stuff drag up to where it's supposed to be out of this danger zone or whatever, this muscle loss zone. And you should be able to, at this point, rather than being all the way up here, you should be able to stay here. Oh, I did that again. And get the results of this graph in this zone. We don't want to be over here gaining body fat because the, the rate of muscle gain over here is the same as the rate of muscle gain over here. It's just over here, when your caloric intake matches your maintenance calories, your body fat percentage stays the same. Whereas over here, if your calorie intake is above your maintenance, your rate of body fat percentage not only increases, but exceeds the rate of muscle gain. That's exactly the idea of a bulk. And the, the two things, and I think these are like the best arguments for being against the whole entire bulking cutting cycle to build muscle is first of all, when you get up to a healthy body fat percentage that you can just consistently grow muscle, you Let's don't hear. want to put on body fat. Yeah. Right. Um, especially if you're at a healthy body fat percentage. So let's say that like that flat body fat percent line is a healthy mm -hmm. body fat percentage. You want to maintain mm -hmm. that. You don't want right. to be above and a healthy body fat because that's unhealthy. That's like the opposite. Right. So, um, so the the assumption would be, if you step off stage, you're probably over here, and this is an unhealthy body fat percentage. Mm -hmm. So that likely, if you're at three percent, you want to creep this up to like eight percent, nine percent, ten percent, and then stay there. The problem is, I see guys that are twenty two, twenty three, fifty percent body fat, and they want to go in a bulk. I'm like, motherfucker, you've bulked enough for lifetimes. Like you do not need to be bulking at 20, 30, 40% body fat and that they want to throw a bunch of drugs at it and they want to, you know, like they'll have heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, liver disease. They'll have acne and they'll think the problem is they're not on enough drugs. I'm like, dude, the problem is you're fat as fuck. Like you're, the problem <laughs> is not that you're not on enough drugs. We need and to get your fat down. Well and just to scare people away from bulking, the only, the the predominant way that we put on body fat is something called a dipogenesis, which basically means fat cell hyperplasia or your fat cells are duplicating and they are becoming more fat cells. And the problem with getting more fat cells is because you can't kill them. That's just not how fat cells work. So when you get to that high body fat percentage, not only do you have large fat cells, but you have a ton of them. So when you try cutting back down, it's going to be harder. So it's like so, a, yeah. Do you remember the other day when we were talking and I was like, my model for growing muscle that I thought, and the medical science says is false, but bodybuilders believe, is you have hyperplasia, then hypertrophy. And then once the cell gets big enough, it'll split again and you'll get hypertrophy. That is true for fat cells but false for muscle cells. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So that bulking can make you permanently fatter and the fat cells have to be like half full, let's say arbitrarily half full, or they don't release leptin. If they don't release leptin, you release ghrelin and the ghrelin makes you want to binge eat. Mm -hmm. 
So every time you get fatter, it's harder to get thinner and stay thinner. And exactly. that like when you, and what I see all the time is that people cheat on their diets and they say, well, it's because my kids have food in the house and that I eat the, my kids' food. I'm like, so believe it or not, small humans don't have different nutritional requirements than big humans. You don't have to feed children junk food and sugar. In fact, that's the reason why they have all of these psychiatric and emotional issues they have. It's the reason why they do bad in school is because you feed them shit for food and their brains end up being made out of shit, not out of actual food. So when you feed them nothing but sugar, that's what their brains are made out of. And then you think they have Ritalin and then you put them on methamphetamines to control their outbursts. So they go into catatonic schizophrenia and it's such bullshit. And where was I going with this? Oh, you're basically forcing them to grow a bunch of new fat cells. So like a morbidly obese seven-year-old is going to basically be fat their whole life. They're never going to be able to lose that. Because they I have so many more that's, fat cells. Um, I, I did a obesity management class. Uh, it was a 400 level class last year. And this is exactly what they spoke about. And it's actually where I got the entire concept of using bariatric patient data to kind of prove this sort of model, um, especially on the deficit side, because I know a lot of people don't believe you build muscle in a deficit for whatever god awful reason. Um, but basically a lot of children who do get bariatric surgery it's because they have something called metabolic syndrome which is extremely like it, it makes it darn near impossible to actually lose body fat and a big and another reason to avoid bulking is because on top of stimulating adipogenesis you're also increasing insulin resistance because remember how we were talking about the intramyocellular right. fat so you're not only driving up your fat cells, but you're driving up your insulin resistance, making it so much more harder to actually step on stage. So why would you do that to yourself? Right. And so the idea is that the off season is, let's say, four months. You have four months to gain as much muscle as possible. And you know that you can lose all the fat in six months, no matter how fat you get. So they, what they do is they take as much steroids and insulin and growth hormone as they can afford, and they eat as much food for four months. And then on the once that four months is up, then they take as much trend as they can take without getting a DV charge. And then they basically just do tons of cardio, T3, clen, and tren. And they try to lose as much fat as possible without losing the muscle. And so I think the idea is here, the growth hormone the, and the trend will raise these lines, these dotted lines here up higher. So you can get a, I mean, actually get, make them go lower. Sorry, it makes these lines go lower so that by using these drugs, you offset the risk of losing muscle. So you can be in an even bigger deficit without having consequences. That's what I think that the drugs do. So this was actually something that I was talking to, um, a Paul Carter about this morning, <laughs> funny enough. Um, but basically the idea and the hypothesis, their current going hypothesis around the mechanisms of steroids and anabolics would be that they're not necessarily lowering those lines. They're just making the muscle growth and the recovery process a little bit quicker in addition to basically stimulating that recovery pathway and i say recovery pathway in quotes because it's not recovery but it's stimulating the same pathway so you're growing almost double on that side of things but the only issue is you can only do that to an extent there's a reason why you can shovel in all the drugs you want but if you're not training properly and you're not dieting properly you're still gonna look like shit I just did a video about this the other day. It was what's better, training or steroids? And I was explaining that the, the training is what stimulates the growth. The steroids help you recover from the training. So if you did eight sets on Monday, and it would normally take you four days to recover, if you're on steroids, it takes you two days to recover. So it means on the third day, you could do another eight sets. And get so in the same one week period, you could get twice as much stimulus. So because the steroids make you recover from training faster, they don't make they don't lift the weights for you. 
They just mean that you have the capacity to do more work. Is that I basically say, what you just said? It's it's a little bit of both. So although like although star okay, so anabolics definitely do increase recovery. That is definitely one one part of the equation. But there's another part of the equation as well. And that part of the equation, like if I were to draw a graph, it would be like if here, you know what? I'm gonna do this. We're using markers now. Okay, so let's pretend that, oh, let's see, where can, is my camera? Let's pretend that this green marker is the pathway to recovery. Let's pretend that this orange marker is mechanical tension and the pathway to hypertrophy. Steroids mm -hmm. definitely don't work on this path because steroids don't impart mechanical tension. That's just not how they work. So we're going to throw away this marker for now. Um, now let's pretend that this marker here is steroids. This is what it looks like. So even though you have, you still have the recovery pathway, you also mm. have the steroid pathway, which is basically acting down the same line, but the initiating factor, which is the steroids and the end product, which would be the anabolism and the increased amount of growth, are different. So steroids, they, I, I'm sure you're aware, and I actually did a lot more deep dive after our podcast, because I was really curious about it. But um, a lot of steroids, how they do it, they agonize like the androgen receptor, that androgen receptor dimerizes, goes into the nucleus and starts all of this transcription, I was looking into some studies, and I can send them to you after. But what we currently are postulating is that steroids primarily stimulate differentiation and proliferation, which is pretty much the same, or differentiation, uh, differentiation and proliferation of satellite cells, which is pretty much the same pathway as recovery. You just have a different outcome and a different stimulus. But if you, but you can't, so there's a big movement that steroids work better than training because there is a group and they there's four limbs. There was that I they don't take steroids. They don't lift weights. That's group A. Group B is they lift weights, but they don't take steroids. That's group B. Group C is they don't lift, but they take steroids. And then group D is they lift weights and they take steroids. Now, obviously, the group that lifted weights and took steroids had the best progress. And the group that did jack and shit made no progress. The surprise was that the group that took steroids and didn't lift outperform the people who lift and didn't take steroids. And my counter argument is if you take untrained people, how effective is their weight training going to be? They don't know what they're doing. And then furthermore, if they're natural and you give them steroids, okay, for, for 12 weeks, which is what all these studies are, maybe they get huge amount of water retention for 12 weeks because they're measuring fat-free mass. But that doesn't mean if someone's been lifting for 30 years and if they've been lifting and taking steroids for 25 years, let's say, and you take away the lifting or you take away the steroids, which is going to lose muscle faster? I'm saying if you take away the lifting, they're going to lose muscle a lot faster than if they take away the steroids. So in a way, the, what I just explained would completely back up that study. So let's say you're training and you're not necessarily training like let's let's say the newbies they were training pretty decently and um given maybe a couple more months they were they would have outperformed the people who were on steroids and sitting on their asses however right. when you take the people who are steroid uh taking steroids but also sitting on their asses similar to the other group which had both recovery and hypertrophy you have steroids, but there's no recovery because you're not damaging anything, which would make right. sense. So now you're taking away the one factor that limits hypertrophy. So now all, all you have is this anabolic thing just going at it without any training. So this would be technically as Good stimulating one. as this because you have one thing of anabolism and one thing of anabolism. In comparison with the uh, with the natural lifters, you've got anabolism and catabolism. So right. it it would make sense because you have more of a net positive in the people who are taking steroids and sitting on their asses. The only like, I guess the only variable here would be how hard you're training and then also time because these guys are going to grow a lot faster than these guys. But 
if that was true, people could just take steroids and they would just keep growing forever rather than just gaining a couple pounds of muscle and then it stops working. And then that's they have to where, increase their dose. And that's where the really interesting part of stem cell age comes into play. We only have oh so many stem cells. We only have oh so many times that we can have our cells divide. So eventually you're going to hit a wall and eventually that wall is going to be age. And um, you'll reach age faster the more cell, the more times your cells divide, which um, and that that especially comes into play when we have things like, for example, like um, when we have like uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and um, a heterocyclic amines and a ton of these other like carcinogens and um, DNA mutagens, which are coming in and damaging like the telomeres because. When your telomeres get damaged, not only do they get shorter, but even if your telomeres are long, if they're damaged, they can literally impart damage on your DNA. And I can send a paper for that too. But that's the um, that's the idea behind like why people who are on steroids can't just grow forever. So that brings up an interesting point. Is so for example, about two years ago, or about a year and a half ago, I had a guy I was on a podcast with, and he was saying. The reason why you're not growing is you're not using enough steroids. So yeah. I doubled or tripled my dose and for a year. That I didn't grow anymore. Not a bit. It didn't make any fucking difference. And I reduced my dose to a fifth of what it was post-show. And I did not lose. Not only did I not lose any size but not, or, or strength, but I'm making the same progress in the gym on a thousand milligrams that I was on 4,000 milligrams. And so that would be like, the, that would be the, um, what is it? It's like the, the cutoff curve, like nothing in biology will go forever. Nothing is an exponential right. curve. So it's an it S-shaped curve, sense. right? It's like, the yeah, S-shaped. it's an S-shaped curve. Yeah, it's S shape sure. So at my saturation point of my androgen receptors, whatever, is somewhere around the vicinity of a thousand. Maybe it's all the way as two thousand, but going three thousand, four thousand doesn't make a difference. But what I'm hearing is I'm at that point where I probably can't grow anymore. Doesn't matter what I do. And that's why I haven't really grown in five years, is that I've just I've been lifting for 32 years now. So after 25 years, there is no more satellite cells. So all the training and all the steroids, all that does is maintain what I've got. There's no growing more. Yeah, that pretty much makes sense. I mean, that's what aging does. I mean, there's a reason why sarcopenia exists and osteopenia and all these things exist regardless of like whether you train or not, it's still going to occur. Um, it's just a matter of like what degree. So like if you have a higher baseline, it's not going to be sarcopenia. It's just going to be your maintaining muscle. Um, and then on top of that, uh, the idea of like only a certain amount of steroids are going to work. But then after that, it's like, there's like a cutoff point. Um, that would also be like on your end too. Like not everybody has in unlimited amounts of androgen receptors, not you, you really only have like, I know that the androgen receptor has a ton of different targets on your DNA, but you don't have like, you're not going to magically like duplicate cells out of thin air. So like when you have an androgen receptor that's stimulated and working on a cell, it's working on that cell, but you're not going to magically get three other cells just because it's stimulating that one cell. It's going to stimulate that one cell. It's going to divide. And then after that, it's going to divide more. But the the thing is, is like you're not you can't like make cells poof out of thin air is my point. So what I'm hearing is at a certain point, you don't have any more satellite cells. So neither steroids nor training can generate new muscle. You're just wasting your time trying to grow. You're better off pulling back on both and running the minimum you need to maintain of both volume Stim, slash stimulus and gear to maintain, but there's good. There's at some point you're just not going to grow anymore. So there's no reason to push it and risk injury in the gym or risk organ injury with more steroids. Oh yeah, of course. Especially considering one of the really big side effects of androgenic stero- uh, andro- eh, anabolic androgenic steroids. I don't know why I said it so weirdly, but especially considering like um, cardiomyopathies are so common um 
just based off of my research from in ischemia, in ischemia, because that's like one of the main things that I am in, involved in currently. Um, hi, cardiac hypoxia is extremely detrimental. It's it, it is something that I would avoid if I could and or if I needed to, especially if I was on um, anabolics. So here's another question then. If you've maxed out what you can do, then why do people need steroids to hang on to their muscle? I know a lot of guys say you really don't need a lot. All you need is like 250 milligrams a week. HRT doses will be enough to hang on to your muscle if you keep training as hard as you did when you trained to grow it. That you could basically just stay on HRT, train like a pro bodybuilder, and you get to keep everything as long as you just keep up on the food and the training. I mean, we don't have a lot of literature on that, so I can't necessarily say exactly what the mechanisms will be. I'm sure that some people genetically might lose some mass if they were genetic hyper responders, but I I can't really speak on that topic just because there's like literally no research on that on that specific idea based off Mm -hmm. of what I've read currently. Um, But the concept of hanging on to your muscle mass is extremely important especially with what I said before, like sarcopenia is Mm. no joke. And it can like the idea of muscle wasting as you age um, can affect your heart too. So like if you just stop lifting, stop doing everything just because you're not going to grow anymore is also something to not do. So I guess the goal would be figure out how to grow. And if you can't grow, accept your body the way it is and just stay lean and healthy and not lose muscle. So with the other thing is, is do the growth. So it doesn't matter growth hormone. Obviously we've already eliminated insulin as useful in the last video. So the, the concept that if you mix growth hormone with steroids, you get new muscle cells. That's not true that you're not going to get, new satellite cells or new mesenchymal cells from using growth hormone with steroids. So you're not going to be able to make stem cells poof out of thin air. Growth hormone mixed with um, testosterone is likely going to stimulate differentiation and growth of satellite cells. That's, that's about what I could see happening, but you're not going to make like, you can't force your telomeres to be unrepaired or sorry, you can't force your telomeres to be, repaired, if that makes sense. Like your telomeres and your DNA will dam- get damaged as you age. You can't force it to reverse. Otherwise, if we could, that would cure cancer. Right. Literally well, cure cancer. Well, I thought cancer cells make telomerase, which adds telomeres to the DNA so that it can perpetually replicate. The problem with that with telomerase is there'd be no way to stop a cell from going neoplastic if it was just hog wild in your muscle tissue you you just start spontaneously manifesting muscle tumors well cancer is um it can be defined by multiple different hallmarks so it's not just like rapid proliferation um and and actually your immune cells play probably a very large part in like defining what cancer would be because your immune system has literal cells meant to kill off cancer um, right, natural killer cells mm-hmm. the and natural killer cells. And then also you've got macrophages, which help uh, uh, specifically the type one macrophages help out the most type two seem to be more, more so aggressors. Um, But they all kind of work together in the sense where you have multiple hallmarks of cancer. And um, just to make a long story short, it's, it's not just like the telomeres itself, but it's like, there's a ton of other issues with cancer that occur, but Either way, if we could repair DNA, we would be able to cure every cancer because then we could just reverse all the damage. So, all right. So let's let's sum it all up. It sounds like, based off of this, the simplest graph. Oh man, don't flake on me. There you go. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about this computer. All this good. is a much simpler graph. That, it, based on this. If your maintenance calories, if your caloric intake is higher than your maintenance calories, then that's a surplus, and surpluses cause an increase in body fat. And if your body fat's stable, 
that means that you're at maintenance, but you can still grow muscle because it's the stimulus to the tissue and the use of anabolics that and or growth hormone that drives anabolism. Now, if you were to eat the same amount of calories and you kept gaining, gaining, gaining muscle, what would happen would be this body weight would trend upwards. So your, your calorie um, maintenance amount would end up going upwards, which means if you're eating the same amount of calories, you're technically in a deficit and you'd start losing body fat. Exactly. And then, it, it would right. decrease your body fat percentage. And as your body fat percentage decreases, oh, well, now you're going to slowly increase those dotted lines up the scale a little bit. And at a certain point, you're going to eventually reach those dotted lines and you won't be able to grow anymore. So what it sounds like, and this is the, the big takeaway, is that this is the two key points I think you really changed for me that I think no one else put together. One maintenance is maintenance of body fat percentage not body weight mm -hmm. and if you want to continue perpetually to make gains you don't add calories to drive up body weight you add calories to keep body weight from decreasing as you gain muscle and the only revision i would make to that little that last statement would be I would keep increasing calories to maintain body fat percent because the idea is not to like the idea is not to regulate your body weight or your maintenance calories. The idea is just to maintain your body fat percentage because it's so essential. But nobody has a scale that measures body fat percentage. All they have is the body weight. And just like how women have a very pathological way of looking at their body weight where they don't understand that it's a combination of fat muscle and water that are variables they think that if they ate a donut and they gain two pounds it's two pounds of fat men are not in that direction they look in it the other way that if they see the scale weight start dropping they think they're losing muscle instantly it looks like you only had a little bit of time and I've eaten up an hour of your time. So if people want to reach you, I'm going to have the links in the description box because you have the best content out there, period. Dude, you as well. You as well. And oh, thank you. As thank soon you. as I get up time. to a higher level on YouTube, I shall start doing lives like this and you will be the first person on there. Because Oh, really? Well, that would be flat, very flattering, very flattering. Thank you, madame. All right. Well, until next time, I bid you okay. adieu. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Fusion Regenerative Therapies, where I am the director of human performance. This is the practice in which I practice medicine. I uh, will be able to order you blood work and read your blood work and help you with therapy as needed based upon the results of your blood work please click the link to get a consult with me and I can help you optimize your performance. Thank you.